you talk so much. Uh, well, thank, uh, thanks everybody for coming to our <coughs> local data lunch workshop. We have today the pleasure of welcoming Alicia, CEO and founder um, of Local Data. First, I also want to thank uh, um, APA Massachusetts chapter for sponsoring the lunch um, for this event. Uh, just to outline the next maybe hour or so. So we had it scheduled from around 12 to 1. Uh, for the first 30 minutes or so, Alicia will be talking about local data, what it is, how you can use it, uh, what the background is, and then we will have some opportunity for questions and discussion about uh, local data, potential use cases for local data. Um, my name is Christian. I work here at MEPC for data services. We are dealing with a lot of data. We usually are, our role is usually a data intermediary, so we take data from somebody, from some organization, we analyze it, transfer it, clean it, and publish it. We are not so often in the role of primary data collection where this tool comes into place, but we have some use cases and some projects in our uh, agency where the toolkit like lo uh, local data uh, looks very interesting. Um, looks very interesting to us, and we would like to explore the um, possibility to use local data to engage your community, your audience with data collection and in the data analysis process. So, um, without further ado, we would like to introduce Alicia and hand it over to you. Great, thanks so much, Christian. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. This is a long room. <coughs> so, just, yeah. there is still room in the front section to sit. One, one more thing. I just wanted to um, let people know, a couple of folks have um, requested free lunches. Sorry, we didn't put them out. We do have them if you requested one, and also the lunch was provided by American Planning Association Master. Yes, thank you, APA. <laughs> um, so hi, my name is Alicia Ruo. Uh, as Christian said, I'm the CEO and founder of Global Data, um, which is a new uh, startup um, that provides digital spatial data collection and management um, in the browser. So local data is a toolkit, um, and it was designed to gather and understand community level data. Um, that can be data about property, environmental indicators, um, local businesses, and, and anything else that you want to collect information about in your community. Um, what it produces is a way to visualize and manage uh, high quality data sets um, with citizens. So if you're a government or if you're a nonprofit or maybe you're a community group and you're doing primary data collection, you can do that with people on the ground um, collecting data in places that they actually live. It's also accessible. So today um, <clears throat> I'm going to walk you through the story of where local data came from, um, how we got to you know, creating something like this, uh, what our process was, what the design process and the development process was, um, what the toolkit actually is. I'm going to go through a few case studies and then we're going to have a chance to demo it. So if you have a smartphone, I'm going to give you a link and you can actually open it up on there. Okay, so here's our team, Team Local Data. Um, we're an interdisciplinary team. Myself, I'm an urban planner. Um, Matthew Hample is an awesome data scientist, formerly at University of Michigan. Um, and Prashant Singh is an electrical engineer. Uh, and he worked at Microsoft for about 10 years. So we have a, a diverse background. So what's our story? Um, we're currently moving into this new industry called civic tech. Um, and if you haven't heard of it, the idea of this industry is that we're changing the way you interact with local government in the same way that tech startups at the beginning of the tech boom changed what's possible on the internet. And this is happening in a variety of different ways. Um, it's happening in startups like Local Data, so small, nimble organizations that are really catalyzing around social issues um, and making sure that you know, you can address a civic problem um, through technology. It's also happening through institutionalizing innovation. So this is happening in Boston uh, through the Office of the New Urban Mechanics. And we actually have someone in the audience from that here today. Um, the Office of New Urban Mechanics is really interesting because it's kind of like Mayor Menino's in-house development uh, team. And they're producing lightweight apps 
that really seek to solve civic issues. It's also government agencies, so beyond institutionalizing an office of innovation, which they have in San Francisco and Chicago, how can governments begin to bring in um, the lessons of the tech world and um, applications that might be useful to connecting citizens to their governments in a, in a more meaningful way? It's nonprofits. It's also increasing the capacity of nonprofits to use technology in an innovative way. And it's an ecology that involves pr private sector as well. And so how can we design companies around supporting civic issues and to contribute to the planning process? So local data began as a project under Code for America. Um, Code for America is a national nonprofit organization that I was a part of um, along with my two co-founders. Uh, and it's, it's a really exciting um, new organization. They go into different cities across the country. Um, we worked in the mayor's office in the city of Detroit. Um, every city poses a problem, and they say, this is something that we are, that's happening in our city. We need help with it. We also came to Boston, actually. Um, and then through a series of uh, intensive needs assessment, meeting with nonprofits, different city agencies at multiple levels, we find out where we can actually make a difference through lightweight solutions. So this is not about restructuring a government IT system. This is about creating lighter weight technology that can really solve a problem as an interface between a citizen and a government. And you can check this out, uh, codeforamerica.org. It's a, it's a really fascinating program. So as I said, we worked with the city of Detroit. There's Mayor Bing. <laughs> um, and you know, Detroit at the time when we went there was really experiencing a lot of, um, a, a lot of issues. They uh, are in this era of uncertainty. They're, they're in fiscal crisis. Um, core city services are being cut. There's not a lot of money to, to go around. Um, they need to do more for citizens with diminishing resources. And so as I mentioned, we did an extensive needs assessment. And so we met with nonprofits, technical assistance providers, um, city agencies, staff people who engaged with, with a citizen right at, at the desk level, but and also city leaders. We had 300 interviews in five weeks, which was, which was a lot. Um, and we also came into this process knowing that this was going to be iterative and rapid. Um, we were going to build a prototype and it might fail. We were going to return to ideas, do an enormous amount of user research to really try to understand who our user was, what their needs were, and then refine our product accordingly. So one of the major issues in Detroit, as you probably are familiar with, is vacancy. Um, when we got to Detroit, there were an estimated 40 square miles of vacant property in the city. Um, that's an enormous surplus of vacant property. Um, and much of that was actually city owned. So in 2009, and on top of this problem of vacancy, there was not a lot of information about where these properties were, what condition they were in, um, who owned them. There was a, a great many different data sets that were stratified. So you had the, the tax assessment data from the county, you had sort of the state records, you had the, the city's records, you had the GIS department's records, and they, they were all kind of broken up. So there was this massive effort in 2009 to create the first ever Detroit residential parcel survey. Um, and this, this, this effort went out to do a survey of 350,000 parcels. So that was literally all the residential property with, between one to four units. Um, and it really was to give the city a, a better understanding of what the housing stock was like. Um, so it was, it, it was a partnership between the Detroit Office of Foreclosure Prevention and Response, Community Legal Resources, which is a technical assistance provider, not unlike MIPC, um, Living Cities, University of Michigan, and Data Driven Detroit, which is um, a data driven organization dedicated to understanding uh, neighborhood indicators in a, in a refined way. Um, and you can check out this parcel survey at DetroitParcelSurvey.org. And as I was saying, you know, why did they need to do this survey? Um, there's siloed data. And also the administrative data sets that did exist were potentially inaccurate. They were out of date. 
a lot of city governments don't like to talk about the quality of their data sets. They think, you know, it's city data, it's good data. That wasn't the case in Detroit. Um, and it, you know, it varies across municipalities. But that was a problem because you can't make <coughs> informed decisions with bad data or missing data. Um, so there's not a real accurate picture of what Detroit's housing stock was actually like. So in terms of the actual survey process that, that, uh, that this partnership went through, 40 surveyors went out over the course of two months and they used paper and pen to document where their houses, uh, where the houses were, what kind of conditions they were in, how many vacant properties there were, etc. cetera. Um, after that, they did the data entry and manual transcription process. And I'm sure if any of you are representing um, nonprofits or even city agencies that do this type of work, this is sort of a typical process for, for surveying. <coughs> Beyond that, they would take their data back, maybe manage it in an Excel sheet or an access database, and then it would go uh, into ArcMap to be geocoded and analyzed. After that, there's maps, reports, and strategic decision making around that data, and, that, and that's what the real value of this kind of information is. But as you can see, that's a nine month timeline. So paper is a problem. <coughs> Um, and it's not just small community groups using pen and paper to collect data, it's actually professional city agencies. Um, and you know, in, in a world where we have access to smartphones and we're using um, our desktop computers in new ways, this obviously varies from city to city. Some cities use uh, digital surveys, some use new apps. Um, but we were shocked to see how many kinds of organizations in Detroit and elsewhere were actually continuing to use pen and paper. It's a tried and true method. The problem is, is that it's lengthy and confusing. Um, and it's confusing actually to the user, so that creates situations where they're more prone to error. So what was it used for? Um, the, you know, they collected all this data, they created a report and a map, and all the city agencies, until the time that we got to Detroit, were using this one data set. So up until 2012, so those three years after the data set was, was compiled, they were using this static data set, which is, which is problematic because if you think about um, the way that property works in Detroit, they have a foreclosure auction every year, uh, houses are rapidly being demolished, or they, their condition changes, um, so three years is a really long time to have a single data set. Um, but what they found was that 26% of the lots in Detroit were vacant, and that was kind of a smaller number than people had expected. Um, and they also saw that 86 of the houses were actually suitable for occupancy. But that number could radically change over time. So at the same time in Detroit, um, you know, you have like this professional city-led uh, residential parcel survey effort. And then you also have smaller community groups that are just collecting data. And maybe they're doing it um, because they need to fundraise or they want to organize around a political campaign. Um, and they need to go to their city government and say, hey, look at my neighborhood. This is the data. Do something about it. Um, foundations do this as well. There's a variety of non-governmental organizations that collect information. So one of the, um, the methods that we sought to really structure us building this tool uh, was, is called human-centered design. And this is a concept um, largely popularized by IDEO, uh, which is a great interactive firm. And, and they actually worked with us on the development of local data. But the idea is that this, the design process reflects the needs of the user. Um, you, don't, you do this through watching. Um, and intensive user research and partnership with your user. It's also a multi-stage development process. So we didn't go into our workshop for, for months and create an app and then throw it back into the market and say, Here's it, here it is, use it. It's really iterative. Um, and, and I'll sort of describe how, how we went about that and um, what user research means to go back and forth between development and production. So we asked ourselves, <clears throat> how can we change the way that civic institutions collect and manage place-based data? You got to do more with less. Um, we needed to increase the capacity of under-resourced governments. We wanted to help nonprofits do their good work and do it efficiently. We were not trying to create a new behavior. This was about 
uh, recognizing and identifying an existing workflow and saying, how can we help? And what we found is that local data, and this is a conservative estimate, has actually cut the time cost of surveys by 20%, which is, which is pretty fantastic, um, considering the, the amount of time these usually take. So we're connecting people to government and we're empowering citizens. Um, and so we're allowing crowd collected data in a controlled way become legitimate. Um, and so for the community group side of it and the nonprofit side of it, maybe government isn't collecting data on the right kind of indicators. Maybe there are other um, conversations that need to be had in the public realm that can really be exposed and legitimated through collecting something as accurately as with using local data. And also just having an online presence does a really critical thing um, for advocacy organizations. And so this is gonna increase the capacity of governments and non-governmental organizations. Um, ultimately, a lot of these, these survey projects typically happen between partnerships, um, between foundations and governments and nonprofits alike. And so how can we increase the capacity across the civic ecosystem? So this is, this is the beginning of the toolkit. So first we have um, simple survey design. Um, so you can design surveys in your browser um, there's a, an easy way to sort of go through and um, decide on the questions that you want, what kind of uh, check boxes you can have, multiple choice. Um, you can save your edits, you can change your survey questions. You can set boundaries for the area that you actually want to go out and survey. Um, and you can send the survey to mul multiple data collectors. So let's say that you have a group of 20 graduate students doing a capstone project and they're collecting data for you, you can send it to them, and they can easily open up their smartphone and do the survey in real time in the field. And that brings me to mobile data collection. Um, so again, this is fast and simple. You have a map interface and you have your customized questions. Um, you can go anywhere with this as long as you have connectivity. Um, it works on Android, iOS, and any tablet. Um, and people have really found that using tablet is actually the best user experience. You obviously have more room on the screen. Um, and typically they want to do parcel-based data collection. So we start with a base map. Um, every city typically has one. Um, and you can literally select the parcel, which will have the city's address data on file, um, and answer the, the questions that are relevant to your survey. Um, if you want to collect information about things that don't have to do with an actual piece of property, we also have point-based data collection. So that means that, let's say that you want to document a pothole in an alleyway somewhere, you can drop a point on a map. And this geo-references all this data immediately. So instead of the old workflow where you're going out and you're documenting, you're writing down the address, or maybe you're doing it online, and you're going to Excel, and then you're geocoding, this is geo-referencing the information in a very instant way. So one big issue in Detroit was that not everybody has access to a smartphone. Um, and this is a really critical issue when you're doing data collection with youth, with, um, with the elderly, who actually make really good volunteers. Um, from the government's perspective, maybe they don't have uh, 20 tablets to send their, um, their inspectors out with. So we've created the, the smart paper, um, which is basically like Scantron. Um, the questions are the same that would come out on the, on the smartphone. Um, you can quickly fill it out. Everybody knows how to do that from school days. Um, you have a QR code and optical recognition marks, which make it able to be scanned in. And so you scan it in and you upload it as an image onto the, the dashboard. Um, and then it, it geocodes it, and so the, the data from this goes straight into the same database as the mobile tool. So the data dashboard is really the central location for you to understand your data. Um, and so if the survey organizer or the, the leader of the project wants to be sitting in their office and seeing who's going out collecting the survey in real time, they can see data entries coming in. And they can see it on a map, and they can also see the answers to the actual survey questions. Um, they can see who put it in. Um, and then you can export it. And so you can export to a Google Earth file, CSV, shapefile, whatever, and actually even GeoJSON, which is 
for programmers out there. Um, and you know, it's it's really great because you can have it in the format that you need, and then you can drop it into into ArcMap and and do your spatial analysis. So the idea also is that this is cloud hosted. So one of the problems, you know, going back to thinking about what Detroit's issue was, they were dealing with a static data set that they couldn't easily update, right? Even if they had gone out on a yearly basis, they had a nine month timeline for that survey collection process. Um, and so they would have to find funding and there's a, a great many steps in the way of them actually <coughs> updating in real time. And so it, I, I think it's really valuable to have the idea of your data hosted in a cloud, which you can of course export and have it as a static data set, but ultimately you can update it in, on the browser. Um, let's see. It's also about sharing data. Um, Code for America and local data are active proponents of open data. Um, and this is important because it allows organizations to and governments to learn from one another. Um, it's about exposing public data sets and, and building off them. So if you think about the city as a platform, when you start opening up data, you have a new currency for cities. And developers, um, web programmers can take that data and build really fantastic apps that can help citizens and almost um, compensate for a lack of, of city services. Um, it's also a way to share best practices. If you are creating a survey every year and you think that your indicators are the most fantastic indicators and that everybody should be doing a buildings condition survey the way you are, this is an opportunity for you to share your survey as a template. Um, and so, and moving into the future, um, you know, we're continuing to build out this tool. Um, we're really in more of a research and development phase for the next two months, and we're identifying features that are going to be really relevant to the kinds of groups that we want to work with. Ultimately, um, this could potentially be a platform for sharing information, as well as sharing um, best practices between groups, and, and really building an online community around data collection. But what about private data? So some of the organizations that have approached us have expressed an interest in private data. Um, it's important to keep some data anonymized. Um, and we recognize that. And so we also provide an option to keep your data private. Obviously, we think that open data is important and it's useful for the greater community. Um, but we, we do realize that you know, this is an important thing for a lot of people. So what is local data useful for? Um, it's useful ultimately for property condition surveying, as we found out, and that was, that was our original use case. Um, but it's also important for public health, so epidemiology and, and doing surveys about community <coughs> health impact, um, environmental assessments, you know, what's the air quality index in Brooklyn, what's the obesity, is, is this neighborhood a food desert, um, emergency management preparation, what kinds of information could you gather with this tool rapidly? Uh, in face of an emergency. Political campaigns, um, community assets, a lot of times people and organizations want to collect information about what's good in their community, what do they like. And then demographic research. So who can use local data? Um, local data is a tool for the public sector, for NGOs, um, for community and economic development professionals, and it really is, a, is applicable at three different levels. So, we have the, the larger established organizations, um, academic institutions that are doing research, government agencies at the municipal, state, and federal le level. Um, we have local and regional nonprofits and housing and advocacy, smaller city agencies, and research projects that have a, have a defined window. And it's a really interesting tool for technical assistance providers that work with a lot of smaller under-resourced groups. Um, We've decided it in a way that a, a technical assistance provider could obtain a license and then really have this as a resource for the smaller guys um, to take advantage of. And ultimately, community-based groups. So we've designed it in a way so that anyone, if it's a grandmother down the street, feels like she wants to be involved in the data collection process, won't be intimidated by an expert tool. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, um, we started our pilot under Code for America. Um, that was in 2012. Since then, we've spun off local data uh, as a startup. Um, and again, we're a civic technology startup. We're part of an incubator uh, under Code for America. So that gives us 
a, a really fantastic runway to tap into um, this network of governments uh, and civic organizations. We're testing right now, we're doing research and development for the next two months, and in April we're publicly <coughs> releasing local data, so this will be available for any organization to use. Um, our pilot right now is, is pretty fantastic. We have a, a great number of organizations. The Department of Health in Memphis, Tennessee, um, the Community Foundation of Southeast Michigan, City of Houston, Texas, um, Place Economics and UPenn, and that was actually a pilot that we just completed in Muncie, Indiana. Um, SF Parks and Recreation, the City of Gary, Indiana, um, UBINET, Ice Pops, which is a, an interesting cultural group mapping out pri uh, privately owned public spaces, um, and CTAP, which is a technical assistance provider in Pittsburgh, and potentially MAPC. <laughs> um, so here's an example of how local data was used. Um, so the CLICK survey was this survey done in Detroit. Um, they wanted to understand where the concentration of com commercial property was lying. Um, to, to guide the city's economic development strategy. So it's the Commercial Land Inventory City Study. And kind of like the Detroit Residential Parcel Survey, they didn't have a good sense of where commercial properties were concentrated in the city. Um, there seems to be a, a very real lack of data in Detroit. So this was a partnership between Wayne State University and the Detroit Department of Planning and Development. Um, in just six weeks, they surveyed uh, 9,000 commercial properties, which was really fantastic considering um, former projects' timelines. Um, <laughs> they produced maps, reports, and they ultimately influenced the investment strategy for the city. Um, this was just a few months ago. Um, we also piloted with Vanguard CDC, which is a much smaller organization. This is um, a community development corporation uh, that's dedicated to a specific area. Um, a neighborhood. And they led this survey of 1,000 residential properties to determine um, the condition of them, if they were vacant or not, and ultimately they wanted to press on their council people to do something about it. Um, vacancy obviously has a lot of quality of life impacts on a neighborhood, and so and that was really the driving force. Um, and they did this in just one week, which was really fantastic. Um, the data informed new city policy, and it actually changed um, an existing program, which is called the White Fence Program in Detroit, to include their neighborhood in that, which makes it easier to actually buy vacant lots, um, and the city provides grants to um, improve them. So they were, as a result of this, they were included in that program. Uh, the last case study I think I want to go into is Place Economics. And so Place Economics is a consulting research group um, based in DC. And they were working with Muncie, Indiana um, to document sites for historical preservation um, around a right-sizing initiative. So again, this is a classic partnership between the university, the city, and the technical assistance provider. Um, and they surveyed 4,286 parcels in four days, which was really impressive. Um, and so they're producing right now a comprehensive report uh, that's going to ultimately influence a right-sizing strategy. All right, so now I think I want to show you local data. So if you have a smartphone or a tablet, you can take it out, and I'll pull it up on the screen. Um, this is just a shortened link. Whoops. Um, but you can type in for the mobile tool, which is probably the one you want to look at on your phone, um, is.gd slash capital D, lowercase d, m, seven, y, seven. And again, this is still in private beta, so that is why this is a secret link. <laughs> And uh, we actually preloaded this with the with the area that we're in right now. So. Can you see if you can go I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> and actually, if you don't mind, like, like just step into the right a little bit. Oh sure. Thanks. Yeah, just just do the mobile tool in your uh, in your phone right now. And I'm gonna pull it up on the screen. So if you don't have a chance, that's okay. <laughs> All right, everyone got it. No. <laughs> Yeah. 
Ready? <laughs> okay. All right. Um, I'll pull it up. So, local data. This is a, also to note. It's this is a browser-based application, which means you can open it. That's why it works on any kind of tablet. Um, unlike an app store app, which is called a native app, this works in your browser. Um, so you type in your name. You don't have to do that. I'm going to allow it to locate me, and it's going to locate me on Temple Place, right where we are. And so the questions that are actually in this survey, Christian designed, which are great. Um, let's see. And so I, when I tap on a parcel, whoops, it turns yellow. Um, and it says, is there a building on the site? We can say yes. Um, is there a first floor business? I'm going to guess and say yes. yes. OK. Going out of this. We could all go outside, but I don't think that's a good, good use of our time. Okay, thank you. Select another location to continue. And so as you can see, there's a nice little check mark to let you know that you've completed it. Um, and I can click on the next parcel in my survey. Um, if you zoom out, this is kind of cool, you can see that the area that we were surveying is actually highlighted in, in red. Um, and the parcels that we can click on were was a, was a data set that Christian had design, had uh, selected before this. So these are only the parcels that we care about. All right, and now we're, we're, we can take a look at the at the mo, uh, dashboard, which probably you can open on your phone, but it, it's it's really meant to be seen in your browser. So it looks like we have 26 responses already, which is pretty cool. Um, zoom in, sorry. All right, and then you know if we click on the on the parcel, is this? There we go. Um, we can actually see for which addresses they came in, in in this in this column. We can see who put them in. So I see. A lot of different people, Nick Caruso, Manisha, <laughs> um, and then we can see what what your answers were. So, lots of yeses, um, and it's really cool because it's in real time, and so it's time stamped. You can sort of see. You can even you, know, you can pull out different data from this, like how long is it taking people to go from from parcel to parcel. Um, you can see if they're doing it right, which is kind of interesting. And then ultimately, you can also filter your questions. So if you have more questions, this is, this is more interesting. But you know, if we want to see the data just for the first floor business, um, it highlights that and it turns it purple. You can also export it. <clears throat> and in the demo, the only ones that we included were CSV and KML. But you know, we also, like I said, have GeoJSON and, um, and a shapefile export. And if you want to change the questions that your survey was designed around, you can actually go back to uh, the survey editor. Um, you can click on edit form. And, and so this was the interface, I think, that I showed you guys a little earlier, um, where you can you know, design the questions. So we could say, is this building vacant? And then it will, it will actually preview for you what, what the survey looks like. So does it generate a new link then, or does the same link stay active? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think I believe that the link stays active. So you probably don't want to do that in the middle of the survey. But the idea is that if you wanted to do have the same area and then go back out again, you could. Um, and the person who has access to this admin interface is the person organizing the survey. So it wouldn't be every data collector could kind of change this. It would be really the person organizing it. Um, and then I'm going to save my edits. Close editor. And so, yeah, that's that's local data. Um, and I'd love to hear from you uh, if you have any questions about the tool, if you have any ideas for different kinds of features that you might want to see. Because um, as I mentioned, we very much are still in the development phase. Um, a lot of really interesting things in the pipeline. Um, as we do our user research, and actually every pilot group that's, that's using this will fly out and watch them use, use the tool, follow them around, um, which is funny. And they, uh, 
they've come up with some great ideas like overlaying historical data and being able to see it across time. Um, and that's something that we're building out. Being able to upload photos. Um, and so all these feature sets are, are exciting and, and in the works. But I'd love to open it up to the room. And if you have any questions, shoot. Yeah. Um, have you done any work with public safety data from police departments? Or? Not as of yet, but that's a great potential use case for sure. Do you have a, a way for data validation so that if, say, two people surveyed the same parcel but there was a conflict in the answers that it would highlight and let you know that there was an issue with the data that the two people gave? Yeah, um, I, I believe once you have completed a survey and it has a check, somebody else doing that survey can't, can't, do, can't do that. Oh, but okay. what you can do is go back into the browser in the dashboard view and change it. Um, but it kind of it blocks you from doing that. Yeah. Do you have to click on the parcel or could you type in the address? You can also type in the address. Yeah, let's go back and check it out. Um, yeah, if you want to type in an address. Um, what's an address around here? 59 Temple Place. Okay. <laughs> That's really close. <laughs> let's see if it works. Yeah, and it highlights that, which we've already done. Oh, wait, wrong one. Might have to click around a little. Okay, well, did you do it? Yeah, so it's brought up 5963 Temple Place. There we go. Um, anybody else? Is the app customized for each client organization that uses it? Like the client organization will supply you with whatever base maps they want to use in the application, or does local data have some national database of uh, GIS data? So, national GIS data in, in at this level is not within our reach. We usually identify the city and the organization that wants to use it, and then we go out and see, A, is the data available for free and as an open data set? If it's not, we'll purchase it. Um, many times the organizations will already have access to the data and they'll actually just send it to us. Um, what happens if you're doing parcel-based data collection and um, down the line, parcel lines change? Parcel lines change. Yeah, that's an interesting question and a problem that we haven't come to yet, redistricting. Hmm. I think that in that case, you would have to sort of rely on the base map that you're using, um, and you could you could update it. So it would it would just you know think about how you would do it in a traditional surveying process. You probably would just have two data sets. You could overlay them and see what the changes were. Yeah. Um, what experience have you had with local governments? Uh, it sounds like the data is in the cloud, but mm -hmm. have they taken those data sets and put them in their local servers and? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and you know, of the pilots that we've done already, it, again, it's been a partnership, so data has been shared between organizations, both government and outside of it. And and that really is the workflow reflected. So they'll export it and then keep it on their servers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you populate the survey form with data you already have about a given parcel? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so the 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 address data. You know, so like the, the little part that you see when you when you go to the to a parcel like that um, is actually coming out of the data set that we've preloaded, um, and so absolutely you can turn on different um, different fields. So let's say like you have historic data that you want you want to note that this is you know designated as a historic district. You could turn that field on. Can can you use it to verify data you have? So let's say you have height data about all the buildings. Stories. Uh -huh. And so, so the survey would actually say the, the current assessor's record says this is a two-story building. Is that true? You could turn on. Really be conditional yeah, you could turn on a field and say yes, no, right? Have and that the field question would be, would, yeah. be, would be conditional based on the data, that right. the underlying data. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. Uh, I think it looked like you had the ability to create multiple choice questions. Mm -hmm. Can you upload a list of those multiple choices from, say, a CSV file to? Hmm. You cannot do that right now, but 
that sounds like a great feature. <laughs> Have you done anything in transportation? Um, not specifically on this project, but actually our team is very involved in, in the transit space. One of our other projects um, brought real-time bus tracking to Detroit, and so we're, we're very interested in, in transportation. And I think that, I mean, what, what did you have in mind? Like, what kind of data? Well, we have a lot, well, I mean, one of the issues we have, and I'm with the MBTA, Yeah. we have to do customer surveys Oh, interesting. Every, okay. Actually, now the feds are coming in saying it to every five years, basically for the demographic right. profile of our customer. And right now, we basically do it every 15 years, and it costs millions of dollars. And every it's two years, years to do. Wow. So, if there's a. Yeah. The budgets for surveys are, are nuts. Um, I, I think that this would be totally appropriate for that. Yeah. How yeah. much is it going to cost in April? It's <laughs> a great question. Um, we're still uh, refining our cost structure. Um, we're doing it in a tiered way so that it's affordable th uh, the smaller the project is, um, and it scales up the larger the institution and the larger the amount of data. Um, but ultimately, we've designed this to be an affordable tool. It's really came out of a, of a nonprofit. So, yeah. Uh, I'm sorry if you've already answered this question. So, I've dived in, maybe it's because I kind of got it stuck in my head because it's something purchase and then we would be able to customize various surveys to collect various yeah. data. Instead so it's a service. So the idea would be that you would subscribe to it annually. Um, for smaller nonprofits that that structure doesn't work with, we have more of like a monthly tiered program. Um, and yeah, you would subscribe to this annual service and you could create unlimited surveys with unlimited users. Some of the, there's, there's a few compet competing products in the space right now, but they really charge based on the number of people using it and the number of surveys you're creating. We wanted to create a flat service. Yeah. So do the organizations you've worked with thus far have like a point person or somebody who's mm -hmm. kind of in charge of, I, I get that it's cloud-based and all of that, right. but it can still become static or out of date. Um, That's true, sure and that I mean, and that that ultimately is the prerogative of the organizer, right? So um, there's a, you know, what we've been referring to as the ringleader, um, which is the person that is in the organization and maybe the project manager, and they're they're organizing it. Um, yeah, it's it's up to the to the group as to whether or not they want to update the data. I think that. We're interested in moving toward this idea of a community platform where data sets are shared so that you're almost held responsible to the idea of updating data from the other people using and looking at your data. Um, so if you have a deeper level of engagement, you know, citizens or whoever is consuming the data can say, hey, this hasn't been updated in a while. What are you guys doing? Yeah. On that point, this might be a question for you, but it might be a question for MAPC as well. Uh, is there some type of collaboration that both parties are thinking about that would uh, allow MAPC to purchase this tool and then trickle down to the communities to use? I'll let Christian answer that. Well, I think we're gonna talk I'm not in a position to answer this question, but it's definitely an interesting idea that we could think about and follow up. I mean, it is. I think it is a very interesting tool for um, for our projects that we have here. So our municipalities. Should we hold off on pursuing anything until we hear? <laughs> <laughs> um, I wouldn't recommend in holding it off. So if you, I mean, if you are interested in using local data, please contact us. I mean, even though we're in our pilot and research and development phase, we're rapidly moving away from that. Um, and we've really identified our, our pilot groups. So um, you can check out our website. It's localdata.com. Um, you can email us, info at local data. And if you are really interested, even if you're not interested in using local data, um, we're really interested in finding more about, about how you do surveys and what kind of surveys you do. So if you're interested in supporting the ecosystem of civic tech and want to answer a survey, I'd really appreciate it. Um, you can also follow us on Twitter. It's at GoLocalData. Um, or my Twitter handle is at Aruo. Then, yeah. Uh, yeah, I had a question. Is there a way to um, answer like dimensional? Say you went out to a, a site and you 
wanted to measure something and enter it into your dashboard. Is there, is there a way to, to incorporate the that to say check the accuracy of where a building is or the height of a building or to check the accuracy? Like if you wanted well, to input it as a text, well, yeah, field, could you, you could. input on your, in your uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, you could do that. I don't know if you, I mean, there's no way to like point your phone at it to no, actually measure it. No, no, I'm just wondering if you had like, um, if you could input like GPS coordinates and yeah. measure that way and then input it that way so you can measure actually, see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. I think that you can you can write it down as of now, but okay. um, we, let's talk more about yeah. that. Yeah. Um, anybody else? Can you yep. just briefly talk just a little bit more about how you envision communities being able to share this data and what that interface might look like and sure. how they might be able to access it and compare given that these surveys are probably very different? Yeah, the that's a that's a great question. And and this is actually really in development right now, which is why I have nothing to show you. But the idea is that at two levels, there um, so there's private data and then there's public data. And then there's the idea of what are the surveys that they're actually using. Um, right now, we've defaulted to make it completely editable and custom. Um, I think the way we originally conceived of this is having templates. Um, and going back to the idea of sharing neighborhood indicators across geographies, um, we're, we're building out a way for you to template out your survey. So we're gonna have like pre-designed surveys that you can click on. Let's say you're a group that's never done a survey before. You don't really wanna go through the whole process of like figuring out what questions to ask. Maybe an, an institution like neighborhood um, NNIP, which is like National Neighborhood Indicators Partnership, has a really refined way of asking condition data. Like what does good versus excellent mean? What's the best way to ask questions about any given indicator? Um, and so the idea is that you have templates that different organizations can use across geographies. And the, the interface would be map-based. Um, so from the survey design perspective, you're selecting a template. From the exploration public moment, you're actually diving into seeing an indicator across geographies. And that lets you also see where isn't their data, how many communities have like collected information on this one thing, you know, almost see it becoming almost like a like a competition to like get a a great like higher level of data across a city with multiple different groups, kind of like organized crowdsourcing. So when they did those like four thousand lots in two and a half hours or whatever, it was, uh, it was a little longer <laughs> than that. <laughs> how did they how did they get all those people together that quickly? You know, what, what were those groups? Is that like a university? Yeah, so let's go back. Muncie, Indiana. They, yeah, Muncie, um, yeah. It was a university, a city, right. and a technical assistance provider. And they uh, they worked for, I think, maybe a month and a half before we were brought into the conversation. Um, and they organized it. And it was a group of graduate students that went out and did a survey. Yeah, how many? Um, I think Probably. they had like 12. 12. Yeah. Thanks, Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Well, I mean, just in Detroit, what was, I mean, do you have any data on how many people have smartphones if we were going to go That is the one number that I've been trying to find for a long time. That, it's really hard number to find. Cell phone companies don't want to share penetration rates of smartphones. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of Pew reports that are really good sources of information about connectivity rates and, um, and, you know, youth population, low income youth, African American populations actually have a very high, like, smartphone usage. Um, so in Detroit, it was actually higher than we had anticipated. That said, most people do have feature phones, and so it was a real, th it was something to think about. What was the, high, what was Detroit, what was the? The percentage? Yeah. Yeah, we don't know. It was just, it was oh. high. That was what we were told. <laughs> we really tried to find that number. It's, it's challenging. I think nationally it's something, it's at least 60% have cell phones. Okay. Let's take one last question maybe and wrap it up after. I've already asked a couple, so if someone else wants to. You can ask one. Anybody <laughs> else wants? Uh, I understand the system is designed to work with parcels, but can you can the driving force be point data sets as well? So yeah, you can, you can enter. I didn't show that in the demo, but you can absolutely drop a point and, and not do a parcel survey. You can map a point. Yeah. 
you can say, I don't, you have to do them separately right now. You have to decide if you want to do point or parcel. Um, but yeah, that's completely functional. Great. Okay. One last thing, uh, the demo you showed, will it be up for a while or are you shutting it down after? Yeah, it will be up for a little while. I think we might shut it down in a little bit. Okay, but, um, so if, if people want to go it, out now yeah, and sort of try this yeah, little thing in the field, data. you can do it. <laughs> we can visualize it. <laughs> Otherwise, thanks a lot. Yeah, Alicia, thank you. For Uh, thanks everybody for coming to follow up with Alicia, um, that's her contact information, or get in touch with us if you're interested to work with MPC um, and maybe local data. Thank you. Yeah.